Welcome to Low Carb Movie Plots, where we break down your favorite movie's plot into a three-act structure. The setup, the confrontation, and the resolution. I'm your host, Kazurk, and today we're covering Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes is a 1978 American parody film produced by J. Stevens Peace and John DeBello. Directed by John DeBello, based upon an original idea by Costa Dillon. The screenplay was written by Dylan, Peace, and DeBello. The film is a spoof on B-movies made on a budget of less than 100,000 US. The box office success of the film led to three sequels, all co-written by the same three writers and directed by DeBello. And now to the plot. The film opens with a scroll saying that when Alfred Hitchcock's film The Birds was released, audiences laughed at the notion of birds revolting against humanity. But when an attack perpetuated by birds occurred in 1975, no one laughed. This is followed by a pre credit sequence of a tomato rising out of a woman's garbage disposal. This scene was shot by rolling a tomato into a sink as it spiraled into the drain, but played in reverse. This is the type of movie magic we're working with here, folks. Her puzzlement turns into terror as the tomato draws her into a corner. Following the credits, the police investigate her death. One officer discovers that the red substance with which she is covered in is not blood, but tomato juice. A series of attacks perpetuated by tomatoes occurs, including a man dying by drinking tomato juice made from killer tomatoes, a boy heard being gobbled up by a killer tomato, and a sequence where tomatoes attack innocent swimmers in a parody of Jaws. While the president's press secretary, Jim Richardson, tries to convince the public that there's no credible threat, the president puts together a team of specialists to stop the tomatoes, led by a man named Mason Dixon. Dixon's team includes Sam Smith, a disguise expert, scuba diver Greg Colburn, Olympic swimmer Greta Attenbaum, and Wilbur Finletter, pulling around a used parachute. So these people are not the best of the best that the country has. Smith is sent out to infiltrate the tomatoes at a campfire, eventually blows his cover while eating a hot dog asking if anyone could pass the ketchup. Colburn and Greta are sent to the sectors, while Finletter stays with Mason. So they all go on missions that basically amount to nothing. Meanwhile, the president sends Richardson to the ad agency Mind Makers, where executive Ted Swan spends huge amounts of money to develop worthless ploys, including a bumper sticker with the STP for Stop Tomato program on it, the better the slogan, the easier you move the masses. A human is revealed to also be plotting against Dixon when a masked assassin attempts to shoot him but misses. A chase takes place, but Finletter loses a masked assailant. It's kind of hard to give chase when you're dragging a parachute on the ground. A Senate subcommittee meeting is being held where one secret pamphlet is leaked to the newspaper editor, who sends Lois Fairchild on the story. While she tells Finletter he mistakes her for a spy and trashes a hotel room attempting to kill her. Greta is killed and further regression has led leaders to bring in tanks and soldiers to the west coast in a battle that leaves the American forces in shambles. Dixon is walking amongst the rubble and sees a trail of tomato juice and decides to investigate. He ends up being chased by a killer tomato to an apartment where a child is listening to the radio. The tomato is about to kill Dixon but then suddenly flies out the window. Dixon peers out to see if it died and he spots the assassin hijacking his car. He chases the assassin with a slow car chase that has since been copied by other comedies. Dixon is eventually knocked out by his own car. Awakening, Dixon finds himself captured by Richardson. Though he did not create the killer tomatoes, he's discovered how to control them and plans to do so once civilization has collapsed, leaving him in control. He is about to reveal his secret control to Dixon when Finletter charges and runs through him with his sword. Dixon's picking up some records when he realizes that he's seen the tomatoes retreat to the sound of the song Puberty Love, but had not put the two together until now. He orders Finletter to gather the remaining people and bring them to the stadium. Finletter remarks that there are only crazy people left in the nearly deserted city, resulting in a motley assortment of people in costumes facing the attacking tomatoes in the stadium. The tomatoes are cornered in the stadium. Puberty Love is being played over the loudspeaker, causing the tomatoes to shrink allowing various people in the stadium to squash them by stomping on them repeatedly. Fairchild, meanwhile, is cornered by a giant tomato wearing earmuffs, hence he cannot hear the music. 
Dixon saves her by showing the tomato the sheet music to Puberty Love. He professes his love to her in a song. The film ends with a carrot that rises from the soil and says, All right, guys, they're gone now. And that wraps up Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. In case you missed it, in Act 1, the setup, the tomatoes start attacking people. In Act 2, the confrontation, the government sets up teams to combat the killer tomatoes. In Act 3, the conclusion, Dixon figures out how to beat the tomatoes using the song Puberty Love, and he gets a girl setting up for a possible sequel, Attack of the Killer Carrots. I give this movie a 1 out of 5 star. It's a real low budget movie strung together with a shoelace. It could be re-edited tighter, but then it would cut down the runtime, which you know they were trying to stretch. I've seen part 2, Return of the Killer Tomatoes, and it's a far better movie. Please like, subscribe, and comment. That'll motivate me to cover the sequel. See you next time.